Uh, Tim Seward, and I work on real-time trading systems that process hundreds of thousands of messages a second. Uh, that's my day job, and then at night I'm a .NET Core contributor. Mostly I work around the protocols area and the, the networking area, uh, and I have a thing for SSL stream. Um, I think I have still the record for removing the most code from .NET Core compared to how much code I've actually added because uh, I like deleting code. And tonight I'm going to talk to you about something called the Bedrock Framework. I'm going to dig into it a little bit by going into a little bit of the history of it, uh, where it came from and why it exists and how we could use it today. So they're called Good Stories. It started on a dark and stormy night. Uh, it wasn't actually stormy, this was two nights after it started, but uh, I was looking for a way of writing high performance networking code in .NET. Work had said to me, we've got this protocol, we need to do it, you know, we need low latency, we need high performance. So I was looking around as much networking code as I could find, and I bumped into some people from the Orleans project, and they, they had some cool networking going on, they'd written their own TCP stack and everything, it was, it was great. And I was in that chat room and someone called David Fowler popped in and said, your networking's all rubbish. You guys should use this new thing called channels that I've been developing. Come over to my, my channels chat room. So for me, it sounded like exactly what I needed. So I hopped over to this, this uh, chat room. I didn't know who David Fowler was, but there was a Mark Gravel in the same chat room and a Ben Adams. So I had no idea who these three were, but they were building this thing called channels and they convinced me that I should use it for a prototype for work which I'm not sure it was a great idea because you know, it was very, very early beta. And as all good prototypes, it ended up in production um, before it really should have seen the light of day. But every time I went back to that chat room, those three, I would say, here's this problem, they'd fix it or they'd add the feature. So it was really cool. I didn't realize who Mark Gravel was until uh, I was updating my protobuf.net package and realized that he was the guy that wrote protobuf.net uh, and he's also here. Um, and so that's how I got to start to use channels. The thing is, David Fowler went to work at Microsoft and said, I've got this great thing called channels. We could replace all the networking in ASP.NET Core with it. Uh, it will reduce, you know, it will delete a bunch of our unsafe code. It'll make things faster and cleaner. And they said, we already have something called channels. And so he came back to that same chat and said, they already have something called channels. Um, which was another secret project at the time. So we said streams, we can't use that. What about rivers, etc.? And it ended up being pipelines. So the night that it became pipelines, I posted this picture to Twitter, which is Ben Adams, if you don't know him, and David Fowler. And, and that was how channels uh, became pipelines and was basically born. So after a while, it ended up in ASP.NET. And then once it was hidden behind the scenes in ASP.NET, it became public. And this is where you're most likely to see pipelines today. Um, if you're pulling out the request in an HTTP, uh, sorry, in ASP.NET Core, you'll normally use the body, but now you can use a body reader, which is actually a pipe. And then you can do something, you can do something here like read async, get the result buffer back, and same on the writing side. So you now have body, but you also have body writer. And when you're using the body stream, it's actually just a wrapper around the pipelines that are underneath. So why is that interesting at all? We'll take an instance here. If we needed to read an int64 out of the request body, with pipelines, what we do is we call read async. We get back a set of buffers, and the buffers are the actual buffers that come up from the TCP stack all the way through to the request body. So we haven't done any copying. We haven't done any allocation, etc. If we did it with streams, we would need to allocate a byte array, pass it into the stream, and the stream would then copy the data into it. So we've already got copies, we've got allocations. We could get rid of these, but we'd have to do our own pooling, our own management of the pools. Pipelines takes care of that all for us. <coughs> and so that, that's how you could use it today. Some important things that ASP.NET Core does with it is, for instance, headers. So if you have got uh, a classic one is authorization tokens, right? We're using JWTs or other tokens, they're huge, big, long strings. If you've got a continuous connection, uh, a keep alive connection, the first request you do, you pass in the authorization token and it, it 
it basically allocates a string for the, for the header uh, and for the header value. The next time you do a request, it can actually just match the bytes coming up from the TCP stack and see if it's the same thing and not reallocate the strings. So that way we've got zero copying all the way through and zero allocations. And this is one of the ways that ASP.NET cores got faster and faster over the last like two, three releases of .NET and become one of the faster web servers in the world. So if we go back to the advantages of pipelines, we've got automatic pooling of buffers with a contract around lifetime. We have back pressure built in, uh, which means basically if you stop pulling those buffers off the pipeline, eventually the pipeline will fill up. You can set those settings, but there are sensible defaults. And it will cause back pressure all the way down the TCP sockets. And then we've got direct access to the buffers that are coming up from the transports. That means that we don't have to do any copying or very minimal copying and very low amounts of allocation. And the last one's also important, that async is a first-class concept. So with stream, it was built with stream.read, stream.write initially, stream.flush. But now with pipelines that only has read async, write async, or flush async, that's important because also it was found in ASP.NET Core as they were going along that one of the big allocations was, because we're using async methods a lot more, we would allocate a task every time we call an async method. So uh, pipelines from day one was built around something called a value task, which is actually a struct type, which means we don't have to allocate it for calling very, very fast uh, async methods. So then, why aren't we all using pipelines? Well, we may be all using pipelines. First thing is, who here is using .NET Core 2 and above today? Cool. Keep your hands up if you're using pipelines. OK. What about if you're using pipelines outside of ASP.NET Core? All right, so we've got about three. So it's probably about what I'd expect. It means that like pipelines are in .NET. They're in, they've been in .NET since .NET Core 2. But no one's really using them. They're kind of just dead code. Well, ASP.NET Core is using them, but no one else is using them. So one of the reasons is that when they made it into uh, the base class library as part of the API reviews, what got pruned was if you have a, so say you have a stream today, the stream's pretty useless by itself, but you have a file stream, you have a named pipe stream, you have a TCP, well, a network stream. So that's how you get your data into your stream and read it. With pipelines, nothing came across. So we have this package by this guy somewhere, M. Gravel again, I think, uh, which actually gives us TCP sockets for pipelines. It has uh, an unfortunate word in the, the title, which made it difficult to explain to my boss why we were uh, importing this package called unofficial. Um, but that's one way we can get data in. But there's no Microsoft supplied way of, of getting data out of TCP sockets or doing anything with pipes. So effectively, all the machinery is there, but there's no way of using it. So that's where we come to the Bedrock Framework. So the Bedrock Framework is really made up of three main pieces. Uh, and these have been extracted from ASP.NET Core. So, sorry, the abstractions for these have been abstracted from ASP.NET Core. And they've been battle hardened and tested in ASP.NET over the past three, four releases now. And the interesting thing I think about the Bedrock framework is we're using these on both client side and server side connections. So we've got transports, middleware, and protocols. Uh, middleware is a familiar concept if you've used ASP.NET Core before. Transports your named pipes, TCP sockets, in memory, etc. And your protocols is your HTTP, your MQTT, or, or whatever. So if we take a quick look at how we would use Bedrock today, if you're going to use Bedrock today. Sorry. So have you all used HTTP client before, I presume? Like everyone uses it all the time. And we know the problems of HTTP client. Like if things are 
you know, you know about disposing it all the time and running out of ports, you know about the fact that it can cache DNS forever, etc. So there's no competing HTTP client to the one that's in the framework because it's really hard to do. If we use, uh, so we're gonna make a project here called demo HTTP client. Reference bedrock. Okay, so the first thing to know about bedrock is it's DI based. Like from day one, it's it's based around dependency injection because it's a, a modern framework. So I'm just going to make an empty DI container for now. And then this is our actual bedrock code for a client. So it's pretty simple. We make a client builder. And then here, oh, always forget to do that. And then here we say we're going to use socket. So this is our transport. And finally, We'll build our client. So if we remember, remember back at the first part, this is we're building our transport up. We're not using any middleware yet, but we can do in a second. What we need now is our connection. So we'll just connect to an IP endpoint. Oh. So already, if I'm writing a new client for something, if I'm writing a new HTTP client, or let me pull that further up, a new HTTP client or something like that, I don't have to worry about like the, the networking. So if I want to build a new Kafka client, for instance, for .NET, which there are some people over here in the community doing at the moment, you don't have to start from scratch and write all the high performance socket code. You don't have to write a bunch of the middleware, which we'll get to in a minute. It'll be all done for you and you can get on with writing the protocol. So one of the protocols that we've written already inside Bedrock is the HTTP protocol. So we'll just hook it up there. And we pass our connection in. And then we can do a send async. with our HTTP request message. And we're done. Okay, so that's not super exciting because all we're doing is connecting using HTTP, which we can do already. But what's cool is that we can start to do stuff like, let me output this, <coughs> content read a string. All right. So we can start to do stuff like, let me check that this works for you. But I'm not lying. We can add our own middleware or we can add pre-built middleware. Um, does anyone here know what console is? Use console a bit. Um, I was quite happy when I saw it on that sign over there. Um, so you can see here we're connected to our service. So as it happens, without knowing you use console, which is kind of handy for me, I built some uh, middleware here. 
that was use console lookup. Uh, do that. So now without changing my protocol or my transport or anything like that, I can throw in some extra middleware and I can get rid of this hard-coded IP address. So I can use a new console endpoint, give it a service name. I can't remember what I called the service earlier. So demo service discovery. Happy days. So now we've got rid of our hard-coded IP addresses, which probably wasn't going to work very well in production ever. Oh, I'm starting the wrong project. Sorry about that. And now it'll just look it up, which means that if someone over here produces a Kafka client tomorrow, or if I produce an HTTP2 client, which is being worked on at the moment as well, so we connect it up the top, it means that we could connect it up to console, and those people writing those clients don't need to understand how to use it. Whereas today, you would either have to write a wrapper around their client, or, or you'd have to build it into your library. So we've got some other cool middleware that we could add. We could add connection logging. Connection logging is an interesting one because it's the very same middleware that we're using straight out of Kestrel that they use on the server side, we can use on our client side here. Uh, config equals config dot add. So. Sorry about that. So if we run it again now, we should have full connection logging. So we can see we've got our HTTP request and our HTTP response coming down there. Connection logging is very handy when you're writing uh, protocols. But then we can add more middleware. We've got middleware for connection pooling. So if I dispose this connection here, oh, if I write the right code, and then I duplicate it, or not, here we go. we get rid of the connection pooling for a second, what we can see is when we run our code, we're actually hitting, we're hitting this piece of code that I snuck into the sockets library twice. So we made a new connection and then we made a new connection down here. But if we turn on connection pooling, It's going to automatically sort that out for us, I hope. We should be now recycling the connection. So you can see there's no second made a new connection. So, <coughs> so that's kind of cool. That's the client side. Why that's important, again, is because I think C Sharp has had a lack of really good clients. So if you take a look at things like um, Kafka as an example we've been talking about a lot recently, there's a really good client for Java, there's a really good client for Go, but there's no good client for uh, C Sharp at all. What there is, is an interrupt to a C++ library, which means you get nasty errors back, it's very hard to debug, it's not as quick as it could be. Um, so what we're hoping is that by using Bedrock, we're gonna get a bunch of people writing new clients or client libraries. Uh, and then from the server side, you can embed Bedrock directly as a service inside your server. So we, we have a lot of 
services at my work that are pulling stuff off queues, right? And they don't need ASP.NET Core in them, but they have an HTTP endpoint for health, an HTTP endpoint for metrics, and an HTTP endpoint for controlling them. What we end up doing is we end up getting ASP.NET Core in there, which means that we have common libraries that we distribute to everyone that says, if you make a service, you need to run this library. It needs to start up, and it gives you the common login and things like that. But actually, it's got ASP.NET Core embedded in there. So we have different ones if you've got a web server. We've got different ones for normal services. Now what we've done is ripped all of those out and replaced them with a Bedrock library that just listens on its own port. So our health check, our metrics and stuff can be distributed as this nice little library without ASP.NET Core. And it can actually be serving stuff over an HTTP endpoint. In the end, it's not a web server replacement, but it's really lightweight. I think it adds about two to four megabytes of RAM use on our services. It's really simple to use. You can get as low level with it as you want. And once again, it's great for your own frameworks. So moving forward, what Project Bedrock needs today is more protocols, and it needs help from the community. So we need people who are really good at stuff. For instance, we want to do something with Kafka, but I've never used Kafka before. I can read the protocol docs, but we need people who know Kafka. They don't necessarily need to know how to do networking, but we just need help, basically. And that's about it. I think I'm done. Any questions at all? Stand you into silence. Can I ask about the availability? Uh, you know, what's the status of this now? Is it available now? Is it likely to be available in .NET 5? Uh, it's not officially sanctioned by Microsoft at this point. It's uh, where Pipelines was before it got into .NET. Um, it's a lot of the, the internals, uh, referencing Kestrel internals, but yeah, the packages themselves have been built out of David Fowler's private repository, uh, and they're in beta mode, so it comes with that warranty. Other questions? It, it is a bit of an experiment. So just, so no, it's, it's, a, it's a play thing of Mr. Fowler, right? It's, it's an experiment in so much that Kestrel's running on it, so all the core pieces aren't mm -hmm. going to go away. Um, you know, the things like, um, you know, the, the, the classes that are actually in the bedrock library themselves. Yes. That, that you just had open. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 I mean, how, how experimental is that? Is, is, I'll give you an is, example. Is, so is, the, is the group kind of, is, they think that that's like the right thing for now, or? So for instance, the, the TCP code that's in bedrock today is actually a copy and paste from Kestrel. They just don't want to expose it at this point as right public classes, well, it's not so much support, it means they can't change it. it. Because .NET has a very strong, like, once we've published it, we're not going to change the API on you and break things, although they do sometimes. But, but everyone gets very upset. You know, if, if tomorrow on the socket code they said, actually, when you call socket, you have to pass in this parameter or whatever, then everyone, you know, yeah. gets into a Twitter storm and says it's the end of days. So, they don't want to expose that. So at the moment, a lot of it's copied and pasted. The HTTP parsers, for instance, they're all from Kestrel. Um, so I don't know. I don't know when, when or if they'll ever so the, officially like, support you know, it. Writers and readers and that kind of stuff. Is that, that's that's new. Yes. Yeah. The, the interfaces for them are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So is, is that? Are they happy with that? Do they think this might change? I mean, it's like I'm asking you to kind of get crystal ball. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Your, what's your experience of taking something from experimental to inside the BCL? It needs people to actually try doing things on it to find right. out what the, what the problems are. Mm -hmm. So if you if you want if you want it to be stable, so, so I'm probably going to jump in there and start doing some retro <coughs> stuff as a protocol layer, for example. And if I find gaps, I'll fix them. But the, the, yep. the sooner more people get in there and play with it, the sooner those gaps get. So, so usually how it works. So how it worked with pipelines was it was outside of. Microsoft and .NET for quite a while. Then it moved into what they call their lab. And then once everyone thought everything was sorted, then it went through API review and got stripped down from there. So, um, yeah. Yeah, they can be brutal sometimes. Many of my features did not get in 
to this day. So. No other questions? Good? Cool.